Welcome to another episode of the Underground Bunker Podcast. Uh, this is your proprietor, Tony Ortega. And today, I'm having a wonderful visit with an old friend of mine, old friend of the bunkers, Johnny Jacobson. Johnny, it's great to see you, man. Good to see you. You're looking well. Now, I like that uh, you look. It's very clean cut. <laughs> yeah, you're used, Clark Kent. you're used to me without a beard, I know. <laughs> um, all right, so you've bounced around. I got to check now. Are you in Paris now? I am. Well, we live just outside Paris, but yeah, still in uh, in Paris and uh, based in France, working in France. That's how uh, I first got to know you was a British journalist working in France. That's and, right. And that gave us some really unique perspectives over the years. And uh, I just was looking some over some of your work, just, just an absolute top-notch work you've done on Scientology over the years. But some of our new readers may not be that familiar with you. Can you can you give us the thumbnail about you and how you ended up writing about Scientology and then bumped into the bunker? Well, let's see. Um, I've been based in France for nearly 30 years, but even before that, back in the 90s, just to give you an idea of how old I am, I had a, a very good friend uh, when I was living in Edinburgh who was uh, living in the same house that I was in. Uh, she was an American, uh, full of life, full of beans, and she went off for a few months just traveling um, somewhere in Europe. And she got back maybe a month or two later and she changed. She was um, still full of energy, but she was completely focused on one thing. She, she basically seemed like she'd found the key to to life. That's the, the vibe she was giving off. And I, I was talking to her about it and she was a wee bit coy about it. Uh, until finally said it's 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 um dianetics and i said ah right dianetics because i seem to have heard about that and it was um you know i i would heard that people say it was a cult and that immediately sort of uh, got a reaction from said no 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 you're, you're hearing the wrong things and she was so emphatic about it and, and so zealous about um uh, defending uh, dianetics and scientology um, but also is so unwilling to consider that there might be a problem that that set off alarms for me. So in, in the sense that I raised red flags for hers by questioning her new her new newfound um, uh, beliefs. Uh, in the same time, her, her manner of defending it, but also her complete hundred percent commitment um, to her new belief system, that was alarming to me. So I immediately began reading, and I said, "Okay, you know, I don't want to. I don't know anything about it. I don't want to offend you. Why don't I read the book, and and then we can talk about it more." And so we left it at that, and, and that mollified her. Um, and I started reading, and and I have to say, not many people I think outside the movement have read Dianetics. I've seen people I know it as a revelation, but it's just turgid stuff. Yeah, and it struck me as kind of I wasn't a specialist in the area then, but it struck me as kind of a, a cut price Freud, and I'm, I'm, I'm from a kind of nineteen fifties Hollywood movie where they kind of dumb it down for you, and it just it was badly written. And there was a lot of stuff that was quite disturbing. In fact, somewhere in here, I have the my densely annotated uh, copy of the book saying, are you serious? There were lots of question marks and exclamations that she can't be serious. And so I, I thought there was there was a problem there. So I started to um, research more broadly. And uh, she went off down south to, to England uh, to what I later discovered was the European Headquarters of Scientology in East Grenstead. And, and that's when I, I really, can I remove this? This isn't going to be a problem. If you, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're fine. And um, and she she went off to the, the headquarters. So I realized she was really uh, getting committed. And um, so I started talking to people and I very quickly came across a couple, uh, Bonnie Woods and Richard Woods, I think it is, mm -hmm. who were very active at the time. I think they may still be active. They were based in England at the time. I think they're back in the States now, I'm not sure. And very soon after that, I got in contact with John Atak, who, as you know, is one of the authorities on Scientology and basically wrote the definitive um, history of Scientology during the Hubbard era, A Piece of Blue Sky. Um, and it's still for me the best book on Scientology, Scientology for that era. It's it's the, the the basic, the starting place you need to go. Right. And what was interesting from him is the words were very comforting and very supportive. But um, John quickly understood that what I needed was information. <laughs> He's like, I, I'm a journalist. I want info. So he gave me a long reading list of stuff. And I started plying my way through it. Um, and he did say, yes, it, you do need to be worried if she's at Grinstead and if she's if she's uh, at East Grinstead. And, and if she signed up for the Sea Org and he, he explained to me about the billion year 
contract, which I suppose most of your readers will know is the commitment to serve Scientology in this life and on future lives. So she wasn't just a, a dilettante. She wasn't just an occasional. She, she'd she gone hardcore very quickly. And then I thought, right. this, this is worrying. So that was the beginning of my journey. I could I could tell you more, but um, it was it was a rough six months. Um, I ended up contacting her family, who I didn't know, in the United States, saying, "Look, you don't know me, and if this if this is none of my business, you tell me." But I'm a little concerned um, about our mutual friend, who let's call Hannah, um, because um, she's got involved in this movement, and it seems to me that it's not it's not kosher, put it that way. And they said, no, 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 we, we agree, we're worried. And they were having similar problems communicating with her, saying, look, it's it's you know, it's not good. And I was saying, look, you need to go easy, you need to be diplomatic, um, and you need to kind of prepare the ground, because I explained to them about disconnection. And this is one of the things about disconnection. Um, people outside the movement who have never had any contact with um people inside don't understand that it's not, it doesn't, it has a power on people outside as well. It's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, if people inside the movement are confronted with the uh, possibility of disconnected, that must be an in incredible pow powerful control mechanism. And you and I have spoken to plenty of people who've, who've had to go through that process. Um, but for the people outside, once they understand what's going on, it is also an incredible powerful control mechanism over them too. They realize they can't just be upfront and straight about their concerns, that they have to negotiate it carefully. And it puts incredible pressure on uh, on, on those people. And I was one of those people at that time. Um, and, you know, I was smitten with with this woman, of course. Um, so that, that didn't help. But if it was bad for me, imagine what it must have been like for her parents. Um, right. And clearly they weren't going to tell me everything, but they were, they were worried sick. So that was the beginning of my journey. And it was a personal trip that took six months. And in the end, uh, she went back to States for uh, a visit to the family and she they'd arranged for her to meet a former member. And I don't think she'll mind me saying that it was Hannah Whitfield who'd actually mm. served with Ron Hubbard on the boat. And she'd seen some of the worst excesses of Hubbard uh, on the, was it the Apollo? I can't remember. I think it was Apollo. Right. Uh, and she was able to give her uh, another another perspective, shall we say? Anyway, and that was enough for her to to give her pause. Oh, and that's of course, great. it was devastating for her. You know, I think realizing the truth in that way, and because even even a gentle intervention like that, and we're not talking about a deprogramming. She wasn't forced to do anything. Even a gentle um, intervention like that can be devastating because it's like being told that the person with you you've been completely in love with you, you thought was the answer to everything, was your salvation has been treating on you has is is a is a is a rogue and a lie it must be devastating and so for a while we we i didn't hear too much from her it took, took her time to recover but i can tell i can say you now that she's she's leading a great life now We're oh still that's living. great and but i what that made me understand it is not just about the people inside it's also about the people outside and the devastating effect that that can have and that but by then I was hooked. I'd, I'd already done six months of fairly intensive reading and I just kept reading. And, and mm -hmm. I started initially, I was thinking about a book and for a long time I was working on that. But I did the around on it for so long because I had my day job as well that I finally realized I'd be better converting what I had into a blog. And that's when I launched Infinite Complacency in about 2008, 2009, when I realized that, I mean, I think Lawrence Wright's book was on the way and I realized now look, he's got it covered. This is a bullet surprising, ruining journalist. Um, I think I need to find another way to, to use the material I've got. And I think the first major stuff that I did was on the violence and the top of the movement, which at the time we were all struggling to get people on the record for that. And uh, people were very nervous. I was talking to uh, people who subsequently went public, uh, like Jeff Hawkins, um, Mark Headley, but they weren't quite ready to go. And frankly, I can't blame them because if, for one thing, I was, who, who the hell was I? I was just some journalist reaching out from nowhere. Um, at the time, I didn't have a profile. Um, I think in the end, the people who broke it were the St. Petersburg Times. Um, is that what they called now? I think they changed their name. But they did a great Pulitzer-nominated piece. I think it was the something, run, the Truth Rundown. The Truth Rundown um, in uh, 2009, right. Yeah, in which they basically pulled people together saying, yeah, um, I was beaten up by David Miscavige. And, and so that was the beginning of the, um, that was about the time when I went public. But what I went public with, apart from that, because then I had kind of pseudonym sources, I did a 12-part series 
Um, after that, I then got involved in the major trial in Paris, and a lot of my coverage then was just sitting in the courtroom and putting in overlong court reports on that thing. But it was fascinating. Um, it was a crash course. I'd done already one one trial in France in Marseille. There was another another trial in 98, 99, I think it was. But that involved individuals, admittedly senior individuals. This time it was two um two departments of the church or the movement, shall we say, um, in Paris, uh, which were who were um, on the charge sheet. So the stakes were much higher because even then there were people beginning to say this could lead to the banning of Scientology in France. So they put all their legal big guns on it. And it was a, a long running battle that went through all the courts in France over several years and ended up in the European Court of Human Rights as well. But in the end, they were convicted as an organization of um, organized fraud, I think. Uh, perhaps not um, the, uh, it certainly wasn't the killer blow, but people thought that at that point that that was a kind of a yellow card and if they stepped out of line again, they could well be shut down in France. Um, but that was a that was a long process. I think it's about that time that, that I came onto your radar because I think you you had found my coverage of the um, right of the truck. Yeah, right. And I mean that's what impressed me so much about your work is you're so thorough and detailed and write so well. And I was just really impressed that a professional journalist was you know putting this much work into these really important stories. Um, I was just looking over from that era, 2010, around that time. I was just looking over a fantastic piece you did about a man named Alan Henderson and his son, Mike, and disconnection and just the way they use, they pit people, you know, family members against each other. It's just so familiar uh, to what I still see going on today. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how that piece came together? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's one of the pieces that I'm most proud of as well. I, I did a lot of my coverage, as I say, either in the courtroom or just sitting in my uh, in front of my computer doing research, checking documents and contact, contacting people by email, which is fine up to a point. But there are times when you need to get out and talk to people. And so right. I did a couple of research trips to the United States. Once when I was working on the book, that was to uh, Florida, Clearwater, Florida, just to get a taste of the things. I was right. trying to get hold of papers, which at the time were difficult to obtain, um, which are now widely available on the internet. And the second trip I did was to California. And I went to see uh, Mike Henderson, whose father was dying in hospice. Um, and uh, Mike was the only member of um, the movement to have left all his brothers and sisters were still inside the movement his father had i think basically been hounded out because um he or, or his then wife were found guilty of unscientology practice doing some kind of spiritualism which was considered to be outside the mm. the bounds of the of, of the movement and that was at, at the time they joined things were much looser i think and so they they were caught up by the new kind of Stalinist wave that came in as uh, Miscavige took power. I can't remember the ins and outs of it, but the basic, um, the, the core of it was that they became victims of disconnection, which, you know, initially in the old days, they had never really thought that disconnection was the problem. Well, of course, it's reasonable that you should cut off contact with people who are, who are you know, hostile to your movement. But when it was actually applied to them in practice, then they had to learn the hard way just how devastated it was because then they're, uh, his his sons and I think there was a daughter. Um, all all his kids basically um, turned their backs on me. He had no more contact with them. It was later when Mike Henderson came out um, that he was finally able to have a be reunited with him. And it was Mike who was willing to talk to me. He was posting about it um, online, which is how I think I got in touch with him. And I said, "Look, um, would he be prepared to talk?" And so we went. Uh, I, I I flew out to to where he was. Went to the hospice. And the first thing we we got, I think he said, was somehow it came out that I was from Scotland. I don't think it was in my accent. And he immediately switched from his American accent to a Scottish drawl. And he said something in, in pure Scottish. It was like straight out of, you know, <laughs> couldn't believe it, straight out of Star Trek. And uh, it was very funny and it was very impressive. But it was clearly he was serious about his Scottish roots. He knew a bit about Scottish history and culture, probably a bit more than I did at the time. And there was a lot of humor there. And we talked about that for a while. And then, then we talked about how he'd got into Scientology. He'd just joined when he thought it was okay. He'd done a lot of work building and building work. He was a building contractor. 
helping um, Scientology with some renovate some of their bases. He did a lot of good stuff, and that would have been for free or or do it cheap because he was a you know he was a loyal member at the time. Um, and then how basically the movement turned its back on him and and his family as well when he was um, deemed to be doing practices which were not in line with the movement and because the rules were changing at that time there was a point when things got very tight uh, and very unforgiving and I think he was uh, he joined at a more kind of easygoing uh, time for the movement there are a lot of people from that generation who said things were a lot better it was fun in the you know 60s and 70s and you could have a good time and it wasn't quite as uh, as scary as it became, even though there were abuses taking place at that time. So I think he was a victim of that kind of um, that freeze that came in. And he said, you know, he, he was in his bed sort of and he knew he didn't have time long to live. And, and, he, and he was saying, this is this is where I am now. But he wasn't bitter. And, and, and I think one of the messages he said, he said, you know, cherish your family above everything, um, because that that's what you need uh, when it comes to the end. It, he, he wasn't bitter, but obviously he was having to pay a hard price. And it wasn't, it was only a, a few weeks or a month or two after I spoke to him that, that Mike got in touch to say, I'm sorry, my dad's mm. passed away. But um, it was a powerful interview because it, it was a powerful story. It was it was quite moving, and he was a very um, articulate, eloquent um, uh, person. But it was also because it strikes strikes to the heart of one of the most destructive policies uh, that Scientology has, and one of its most powerful tools of control, which, as you and I know, is is disconnection. And you can talk about it in the abstract, and um, Scientology spokespeople will say, "Well, you know, other churches practice similar things, like shunning." as if some, somehow that makes it okay. But no, it's a devastating um, tool and, and it's, a, it's a form of abuse and control. And, and it's one of the th things that I dislike most about the movement. Well, and in that piece also, you were uh, pointing out something that I, I have since then. And that is how the, the very nature of Scientology uh, is toxic for the family bond because they have this idea that we're all thetans and we've jumped into these infants in the maternity ward. So there's no actual connection between you and your parents. Uh, it, you know, I've heard Scientologists say, well, you might be uh, a child to these parents in this lifetime, but two or three lifetimes ago, they may have been your children. You know, there's no, that whole idea of that biological family is kind of a fiction in Scientology. And so that enables them to think of things in a more sort of abstract cosmic way. And I think, you know, Alan Henderson was getting at that a little bit saying that, you know, there's, there's no such thing as family ties in Scientology. Now I know there are Scientologist families that are very tight, but I'm just saying in general, if you actually buy into Hubbard's cosmology, the, the family is a fiction. And I, I think I've been struck the same way you have at, at the devastating way disconnection is used as a kind of political attack tool to control people, to threaten people, to keep them afraid to say anything because they know how, how easily Scientology can rip apart a family. Yeah. It's really disturbing. In fact, I was listening you, you were in, involved with a podcast. I don't know whether it was your podcast or Chris Shelton's podcast. And you were discussing something very similar at that point. But yeah, it's it's the it's the way in which the ideology suddenly translates into something really destructive on the personal front. And John Atat made similar points to me about this. He was really good at making those connections as someone who had been a longtime Scientologist and was able to see the connect between the ideology and the what might seem to be innocent looking um, precepts and the way that was actually applied in real life. And, and when you're coming from the outside, that has to be pointed out, or at least it had to be pointed out to me. It wasn't obvious. At first I was thinking, this is just silly. And why, why are you doing this? But then when you talk to former members and say, this is the effect it had on me, and this is how it changed my thinking, then you begin to realize, ah, so this is how it's actually working in practice. And it's that's one of the really valuable contributions that a lot of former members now who are speaking out and there seem to be more and more of them that's one of the valuable contributions they're making they're saying this might look anodyne to you it might look just a bit silly but no in fact when it's applied in real real life which is to say in real Scientology life this is the effect it has on you and and the thing about Thetans is is a great example so many shocking stories of people 
just not looking after the kids, not because they were cruel, but because they had to serve Scientology, especially if they were in the Sea Org. Then, then there was no question about, you know, uh, looking after your kids. You had to go and do the work and save the planet because basically that's what you're being told. You were there to save the planet and, you know, those are your priorities. And the other thing that's really telling, one of the books which you don't actually need much imagination to see just how destructive the um the the ethics are is scientology's introduction to ethics but there it's set out in black and white you know scientology comes first the the group in terms of the group priorities are scientology and everything else comes after family all other loyalties are secondary and the other thing that they say somewhere along the line is in in uh, the ethics thing is the thing about as long as you bring your money in for Scientology, your ethics are great. That's it right. doesn't matter what you're doing. And I think he actually says somewhere, you probably have the, the quote better to mind. I, I've not been looking at this for a while, but you can basically get away with anything as long as your stats are up, which is mean, which means as long as the money's coming in, as long as you're generating profits. Now right. I was thinking, hey, minute, you know, that's like something out of a Glen Gary, Glenn Ross or something. I mean, that's that's pretty uh Hardcore, and they're in black and white. It doesn't take much imagination just to see, you know, how ruthless the ideology is. And then there's another element that adds to that structure you just were talking about, about the parents dropping off their kids because they've got so much work to do. What reinforces that with them is that this idea of past lives, and that you may not remember that you've lived for 76 trillion years and you've lived countless times and you've done incredible things, but you can recover that. And your child that you're dropping off at the org has lived countless times and they have somewhere deep in there, the knowledge of how to fend for themselves is because they're really little adults in small packages. So that also reinforces the idea that you can just drop your kids off because they're going to call on their past lives to fend for themselves. It, uh, yeah. And that, that's really disturbing because then you have a situation where they think it's okay to have 12, 13 year old uh, kids auditing adults and asking them really intimate questions about their sex lives and having the kind of conversations that kids should not be having. Because as you say, they are adults in in uh, in, in children's bodies. And so again, that's a, another logical con consequence of the ideology that's been foisted upon you and the damage that must be doing to those kids. And of course, now we've got a whole new generation of kids who grew up in Scientology, but have now um, disentangled themselves from the movement, who were able to talk about that and talk about the kind of damage that that, that did to them. And, and, and I'm thinking of uh, Jenna Miscavige, who I think was the niece of David Miscavige. She was one of the first, and for a long, for, for a while, it was a long way back now, they had ex-Scientology kids. I don't know if that's still going, which is a network of former uh, second, third generation Scientologists who'd grown up in the movement and who had to basically learn what it was like in in the outside world once they escaped. Um, that was a, really that was a huge moment. That was that was right around that era too. Was hmm. uh, that was two thousand eight uh, before the Tampa Bay Times special? Jenna Miscavige Hill, Astra Woodcraft, and uh, Kendra Wiseman. Mm -hmm. I, I hope I got the name right. <clears throat> Those three young women started Ex Scientology Kids, which was a website about what it was like to grow up in Scientology. <clears throat> And I remember it had an immediate effect on press coverage because you remember this era. There was a time, you know, like with the South Park episode in 2005, that sure, everyone liked to make fun of Scientology and Xenu and all that. But ex Scientology kids got some coverage that said, wait a minute, this is not just a silly space opera thing. There's some real lives being affected here. And I, I thought that that made a big contribution to changing the way the press treated Scientology and, and sort of made a little correction at that time. Um, but I, I want to ask you about that, the, the whole, so the uh, whole um, press uh, environment. Um, you know, you, you, you said you had a day job where wasn't, was there, I, I know it was tougher then to get stories about Scientology out. What was what were you finding uh, as a journalist working in Paris? What were your different outlets and what were you being told that you felt well, that you had to go on a blog instead? Yeah, I mean, well, the deal was that um, 
if I was, to, I, I went to my employees and said I wanted to do that and said, that's fine, but you, you do it on under your own name. It's nothing to do with us. And so I've always kept the two separate. But talking um, to French journalists at the time who were working on similar things, who, who were uh, who were trying to, to publish stories, it was actually easier for them at that time, I think, because things were beginning to change. They were picking up what was happening in the United States, maybe a wee bit late, but they were getting there. Mm -hmm. And there was also some interesting work done by Emmanuel Fanstan um, on Scientology's operations in France, their lobbying. He's now working for Liberation, he's moved on to other things, but he did some good work at the time. There was Serge Faubert, who in the 90s got hold of some interesting internal documents and uh, made the most of that. He's still going strong. Um, and they got some hostile reactions. Uh, certainly Serge in the 90s, I think, got more flack than, than most. Um, but uh, he he's, uh, gives me the impression of being a fairly thick-skinned guy. I think I went to speak to him briefly. It didn't bother him too much. I think the atmosphere in France is different, perhaps because um, the, the, there's a less tolerance for that kind of nonsense over there. There was a fairly hostile atmosphere for Scientology at the time. Um, so I don't think... They felt quite as threatened. I don't want to speak for them. But when I was trying to get interest in the book, um, that was a different thing. Because then I was yeah. talking to publishers um, in the United States and Britain. And this was in, I don't know, late 90s, early 2000s, I would say. Uh, and I had a good agent who was really, you know, working hard with me to try and get the, the proposal done, spent a lot of time on it. And we got some, shall we say, we got some very nice rejection letters. There, there you go. <laughs> There's my consolation prize saying, look, right. we really like this. Um, but first, they said, they pointed out, look, we, you don't have a profile, you, so we can't sell the book on, on your back. Um, so probably not a smart idea to write my first book on Scientology without having a profile as a, as a reporter, because I'm more of a sub in my day job. Um, but they also said, we're just worried about about the legal hassle because they all had these stories from the 1960s and 70s about these massive lawsuits that Scientology had launched against um, English newspapers. Most of them, I think, had heard something about the massive litigation against Time magazine with its cult of greed and power front page. Was that Richard Bihar? And, and that's that's become legendary. I mean, OK, right. they won. Uh, time won their their cases they defended it successfully but it cost them a lot of time and money and not every publisher is, is willing to go through that kind of um, right. hassle so right. i occasionally got one or two people say can you do a wee story on this or that and and i would do something a minor one but in terms of major investigations so for example when i was trying to pedal around the story of the violence at the top of the movement um, people just were too nervous. Though in their defense, I would also say I hadn't yet got people to go on the record name. I had pseudonyms and I had um, people confirming other people's stories. So they, I think they were right to be cautious. But there was still a lot of, a, a lot of um, reluctance to tackle Scientology, especially on a big story. They were more willing to go for the kind of aren't these people silly stories which i'm not interested in doing because as you right. said that's not really what the story about scientology is scientology is about i'm a little impatient with some of the coverage you get or some of the people making fun of the science fiction beliefs because that's kind of missing the point you believe what you want it's about what people are doing and what people are being forced to do inside the movement that's what counts you need to really be focused on uh on the abuse that's going on and and some of the coverage i think was tr irritatingly trivial and when you wanted to tackle them more hardcore issues then they weren't quite so uh gung home and it's so much easier well, to make a few cheap shots about their beliefs i'm glad that we're reminding people that you were on that important story about abuse from miscavige as early as anybody was and uh that became a huge story at that time i mean it's really that also so you know, with the scientology kids in 2008 and then in 2009 we get the story of miscavige beating people and also the whole that those two things really changed the game in a big, big way. What are some of the other ones that you really enjoyed covering uh, over the years? Well, those two stories certainly uh, they they were uh, they were really interesting. Um, I I have to say I'm a bit of a nerd. I love the court work. It's really interesting to see the arguments being laid out in court. I've covered. Let me see three Scientology trials now. The first was in about 1999 before I was publishing anything uh, which I'd originally intended as material for the book and which never got published I should really write it up sometime and that was the Marseille case in which one guy uh, or specifically one guy the head of the organization was on trial um, for hard sell um, 
uh, to the point where people have been pushed too hard. And he was eventually convicted of fraud or something along those lines. Wow. I'm one of two of the senior members as well. Wow. It was really interesting because there were some interesting stories that came out of it. There's one anecdote in particular which struck me was uh, one of the former members who had who was, I think, giving evidence, who had been, might have been prosecuted, but they eventually decided, no, he's more use as a witness. He said, I was in the park one day and my boss was telling me, um, how would you recruit people? Who would you recruit? And he looked around the park and he saw a young couple that seemed to be quite happy walking together. He said, well, they, they look like good candidates. They look like productive members of society. And the guy said, no, no, you don't get it. And he pointed to some guy who was sitting alone on the park bench looking gloomy. You know where I'm going with this. And this was all the thing about um, Hubbard saying, look for the ruin, look for the vulnerable people, and then say, you have a solution for this. And that's how you draw them in. And it was a very striking moment, a very striking anecdote, and because it came from a Scientology in the courtroom. Um, and uh, there were all kinds of little stories that come out uh, of the courtroom with that. And the other thing about the courtroom that is useful is that they will publish um, internal documents. And at the time, I think there were very few people speaking out. But there was a guy called Roger Gonet, who was a, a veteran Scientologist. He'd been quite a senior member running one of the orgs in France in the 1970s, and then he left. And then he he's devoted decades of his life um, to denouncing them. And he was able to quote chapter and verse. He's a bit like um, John Atak in, in Britain. He was able to say, the reason I'm telling you that they're, they're lies is because this is the thing about you can tell lies to the people outside because it's for the greater good. And the reason I'm telling you they do hard sell is because this is what Robert L. Ron Hubbard wrote, you know. And make money, make more money, do anything you can to make money. It's, it's basically, I'm paraphrasing, is what he was saying. So he was able to quote chapter and verse, which meant the uh, prosecutor was able to do the same, or the lawyer for the party civil, the, the plaintiffs. And so all that ended up in the judgment, which means, and we know how how aggressive Scientology can be about litigation, which means that I could quote this perfectly um, uh, perfectly legally and without any worry. But the other interesting thing too is I got to hear the arguments from the defense. And when you're doing court reporting, you can't pick and choose. You have to do that. You have to do both sides and then you have to do the summing up. And that was an education for me to get an idea of the kind of defenses that were coming through. And it was often it always based on religious freedom because that we have the right to our beliefs and up to a point that is certainly true. The question is whether what they're being accused of in court is is going beyond that. And, and that was the that was the question in court in Marseille and in Paris. And in both cases, uh, the courts decided, no, you've you've gone beyond just exercising your beliefs. Now you're actually abusing people uh, and you're you're driving hard sell to the point of uh, to the point of um, well beyond the the legal line and another trial there was another trial in Lyon in I think 96 or something which I wasn't able to cover at the time uh, because at the time in any case my French probably wasn't good enough but also I was too caught up with my new job and that was uh, following up the suicide of a uh, Scientologist uh, Patrice Vic I think it was mm. who been again basically pushed the limit by hard sell and somebody was on trial there for that and again there were convictions I can't remember the details of that but there is a book Book, which has been written uh, by people who sat in court as uh, as I did for the other trials and basically they wrote up the best bits and and they published it and it is a real eye-opener and again there were convictions so those are the three major cases I managed to attend two of them and of course the other case I attend was was in Brussels only a few years ago 2015 I think uh, when it was a similar kind of case against Scientology as to the one in Paris which led to convictions but the problem in that case uh, was that the prostitute uh, hadn't been clear enough about who had done what. He'd done, as far as I can see, a very good job about building a, a kind of um, a description of how Scientology operated both in Belgium and internationally. But he hadn't done the knots and bolts of who had done what. And the judge, in his, and he'd actually warned the prosecutor when he was giving his summing up, saying, look, this is all very interesting, but you're not telling me who did what. I need more concrete stuff. Uh, and But he just didn't, he hadn't done that yet. I think he'd missed, I think he just got too deep into it. As, and I know how that feels. Um, so the court, the judge in the event, uh, he threw the case out. And the system in France and Belgium is different. The judge had a much more active role during the trial. He will intervene. He will question witnesses. And in mm. fact, his questioning of the witnesses was far more um, probing than anyone else's, uh, certainly because he was, he actually reduced one or two. I, I shouldn't laugh. It's, 
he reduced one or two of the witnesses to tears. It was actually quite distressing to see mm. um, because there were people there who were clearly as much victims as they were um, uh, exploiters. Uh, and they uh, they couldn't answer his question. He was asking very straight, non-ideological questions, not not to do with, um, with Scientologist ideology. It was just basically bread and butter stuff. And they couldn't justify what they were doing in terms of, in the terms that were being presented outside the court. Of course, it made sense to them when they were in Scientology because this right. they thought they had to do. But then when they were confronted with this different reality, it was devastating for them. And some of them were were, were um, on trial. Other ones were just witnesses. But they they really suffered. Um, and, and that was quite painful to see. And as I say, the judge, although he noted in his judgment, he come across some very distressing stuff there. He said that, unfortunately, the, well, not unfortunately, the, the fact is the prosecution hasn't made their case because they haven't said he, who did what to whom exactly. And another interesting point he made, if let's see if I can remember this rightly, he said, if the prosecuting is arguing that the Scientology is a top-down organisation and the orders come from above, then can we really say that anyone is responsible mm. in brussels mm. and i thought oh that's that's a that's a really heavy one to tackle because you could well see the defense lawyers coming back to that in a future case saying look if you are arguing we're a top-down autocratic organization then who can say that we're responsible and that's that's a whole new defense and in fact they they concentrated mainly on the religious defense and they were very strong on that um, they said, obviously, there's no case to answer. The prosecution hasn't proved the case, but they went very strong on the religious defense angle. And to a certain extent, the judge um, agreed with that. So, as I say, I say I'm a bit of a nerd, but there is so much interesting stuff that comes out court. Cool. You know this as well as I do, because you've been covering stuff. Documents get discovered um, that you wouldn't otherwise be able to publish or to talk about. Right, right. Once they're out there, they're in the public record. And I know that the journalists in the States and, and here, I think, who specialize in going through the public record uh, is even better in the States because you have so much that comes into the public record that is possible to get hold of. It's much harder to do over here, but it, it can be done, especially if you have um, contacts among the what they call the party civil, the plaintiffs, because they're lodging complaints and they have access to documents, they can pass pass that on. But um, it's 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 a gold mine, you know. And I'm amazed in general why journalists don't make more use of the courts to start investigations, um, not just to look at the end of it. So this should be the starting point of an investigation. But um, you know, that's just me. Maybe I should get out. <laughs> Well, I remember when that was happening with the Brussels case because you were sending us dispatches, and it would, I remember how disappointing it was that this case that had been in the you know preparation for so long, so many years, was suddenly dropped. But in France, Scientology has still been convicted of fraud, right? That's right. Yes, I remember and at one point you said to me they have since they have been convicted like a couple of times in france if they get convicted another time it could be game over so uh i think because of that i remember mike uh render rod keller they were really skeptical that scientology would ever open an ideal org in france or do anything like that because they felt that they've had this court stuff hanging over them and it's not a good it's just not a good uh environment for scientology but now they are building an ideal org which i think is surprising have you kept an eye on that much at all i think you've sent some things to me about that i i've kind of kept half an eye on it um once the russell trial was over i realized that i was exhausted i've been working seven days a week commuting between Brussels and paris and that's when i basically shut down on scientology coverage because i just needed to get my act together and, and, and get a life um so i i've only keep, been keeping half an eye on scientology um, but, I mean, you say Scientology has been convicted twice. Well, in fact, as an organization, I think it's only been convicted once. Okay. I think there may have been another conviction, but it was on something fairly trivial uh, to do with um, data protection. Um, the other convictions are, are uh, having said that, they are, they are serious. There was the the, the suicide. Um, but that was, again, that was an, an individual in the UN. It right. wasn't an, the organization. And way back when, I think in the 80s, there was a conviction for a death at a Narcodon center. But again, mm -hmm. these are individuals. It doesn't surprise me that the Scientology is pushing hard because um, the priorities, the political priorities in France have changed. They have, let's just say they have bigger fish to fry. I mean, remember we've had the... The jihadist attacks we had um, a few years ago, I mean, obviously that's um, changed everything. The uh, the organization which is meant to kind of monitor cult-like action 
has is still looking at Scientology, but I think has moved on to other things as well. They're looking at um, uh, different organizations, different movements. And there's been criticism about the way it's been moved, uh, that may have been run. I think there was a senior official resigned recently because they said, we're just not getting the resources. And so it's not clear to me that the political will is to focus on that. And perhaps they're right not to because there are more important things to do. So I don't think Scientology feels threatened because they probably recognize that the, the authorities have more important things to be looking at, especially with the Olympics coming up, they'll be worrying about security. There's all kinds of messy stuff going in France, which which I'll, I won't bore you with, but which suggests to me that uh, Scientology is not high on the agenda in the way it might have been in the past. Well, you did go uh, back to the British Isles for a while to do some more schoolwork uh, a few years ago. And during that yes. time, during that time, you did take on a new Scientology project that I think we all found really fascinating. You did a really deep dive into membership and what Scientology has said over the years, what we can get from public records. Can you remind our readers what were some of the conclusions you came to? Yeah, that was fun. I mean, that was I went to Birmingham to do uh, an MA in data journalism. Um, so an obvious um, project, the, the opening project was to do something about Scientology's grandiose claims about how they have millions of members around the world. And they ha they have this printed this over the years, um, dozens of times uh, in their own internal publications, uh, but also when they talk to the press. So I wanted to start with those and compile as many of those as I could over the years and then try and get some kind of idea of what the real numbers were in terms of um, internal documents, in terms of sales of books, and also talking to former members who were in a good position to know, such as I think Mark Headley was helping with that. And so you were good, good enough to give me a wee plug on that when I, I ran something um, on in the underground bunker. And then people started sending us, ah, you want to have a look at this? This is good. And there was all kinds of internal documents saying, we have millions of people around the world. And then saying, well, I can tell you I worked in that org and there was about 20. So, uh, <laughs> and so the, so the um, maybe it was all the body teachings. I don't know. I, yeah, I should, exactly. <laughs> I shouldn't be flippant. But but it was clear that there was a large gulf, that, that to, to cut a long story short, between the grand and grandiose claims that they've been making over the years and the reality and the reality from well I, I may not be completely up to date but in terms of sales of e-meters and every Scientology needs to have an e-meter in order to do the things in fact they're meant to have two I think in case one breaks down right so from sales of basic stuff which you have to have like e-meters and some of the the foundational materials um, it's clear that they're not um, uh, selling that many they don't have anything like the numbers um, that they claim, and that the number of active members worldwide is probably in the tens of thousands, and maybe even below thirty thousand. I think that's the last I heard. Um, you may have got more up to date information on that, but I have noticed an explosion of membership. Well, that's. So I mean, that's. It's important to get the magnitude right. I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, they're they're up in the millions, and the reality is in the tens of thousands. It's just a massive discrepancy. Yeah, and I think it's. Just, I seem to remember that the literature got literature got a little bit more um, cautious as the years went on, and they realised, oh, hang on, they're onto us. We need to be a bit more careful about this. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as I can tell, and from the people who who know best, uh, people like Jeff Hawkins and Mark Headley, um, that's the, that's the order of scale. But that's what makes, in a sense, the more even more impressive, because um, they punch well above their weight. They got lots of money from you know rich celebrity members, but also from what I think the, they're called the whales. Yeah, the, the mega rich um, guys who who made a lot of money doing something or other. Um, and they're still plowing it all in in there. I, something I find a slightly ironic about these people who, who kind of these sharks out in the business world, and yet they're still completely hooked on Scientology. It, it's like they have a blind spot. But I mean, you know, that's their that's their life. It's it's up to them. But that's what's funding, as far as I can see. That's what's funding Scientology at the moment. And also this interesting practice of opening deluxe empty buildings. Um, I know it's just crazy. Go figure. Maybe they have a really good realtor somewhere who's advising them. I don't when know. When you were doing that, didn't you find uh like a 1969 book that on the on the cover it claimed 15 million members for Scientology at that time, something like that? I think I did. I did a wee trip down to the offices of um Infor, which is one of the 
Uh, it's the Information Network for New Religious Movements, something like that, which a lot of people don't like because it's run by Aileen Barker and they they see her as being too sympathetic to to these groups. I mean, even the term new religious movements is right. for many too much, many people too much of a concession. Yeah. Um, but they also have a really good um, library. So I had a wee look there and I think it was there that I found it. And, and they were good enough to let me, you know, take take the odd photo, I think, as I, I recall. And I've talked to Alien once, Alien Barker once or twice. She's attended one or two of the conferences, the International Cultic Studies Association. So she is, unlike some of the other academics in in that uh, domain, she's at least willing to engage with people who are much more critical um, of Scientology and of, of other similar movements. So I I have to give her respect for that, even if I don't. Um, agree with some of the positions. Some of the other people are just completely. Oh. Their, their policy seems to, to be: we believe everything they say, and anyone who criticises them, well, they're apostates, and apostates are by definition embittered and unreliable, uh, which seems to be a curious state of affairs. Um, but that's just how it is. But yes, I got some good material from them. I got some great material from former members saying, "Hey, you're going to love this," and sending me stuff. Um, and that was really, it was fun. I didn't, in the end, there was there was a final chapter I wanted to do to try and bring it all together. But my studies m- took me on, and I had to move on to other projects. Well, that's what I was going to ask. So, so how did it turn out with your advisors or whatever? Were they thrilled? Were they blown away or what? They, yeah, they were quite happy. They said that that they were very tough. My 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 tutor was Professor sort of Paul Bradshaw, who was a kind of the leading figure in, in data journalism. He's a, he's a great guy, really good. He's like a geek and a, and a journalist at the same time. And he says, it was good, but your graphics, your graphics could have been better, <laughs> which was true. You have to look at them and they look a bit kind of steamate. And they're like, okay, I'm sorry, but but the figures are good. The research, yeah, yeah, but the, but, but the graphics, you know. So I think I lost a mark for that. But no, they, they were relatively pleased. But after that, I thought, now I need to move on to something else. I need to get out of my comfort zone. And I started looking at other subjects and that was fun too. I'm glad I took the year out. It was, I needed time to kind of, decompress and reset and decided what I wanted to do and I was at one point thinking of moving back to Britain and getting a job in London but I thought I actually miss Paris I really miss Paris and so we in, ended up moving back and, and I haven't regretted it um, I, I'm afraid I've gone native you know I, I wear a berry and smoke G10s when nobody's looking you know well I'm uh, I really appreciate you're there and in 2015 uh when my book came out um I kind of went a little crazy and went all over the place to to have little events. And the only reason I even attempted having something in Paris was because you were there and you set everything up. And I'm still here. So for the next book, (laughs) you set everything up. We had a nice little venue with people there. It was a lot of fun. And I just want to tell you again, how much I appreciated that. That was a good time. It was my pleasure. It was good to actually meet you in the flesh as well. We should do that more often, you know. But uh, maybe one of these days I'll get back onto this the thing. But, I, but at the moment, I've got other things I'm doing, and I have a wee dog that needs to walk every day. So it's a question of priorities. But uh, well, I have still asked you for things on, on occasion, and you've come through on a on a few pieces recently. And I I just I love having a real journalist who knows the 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 drill over there because you know i'll hear something about what's going on in france i'm like i better check with johnny because you know you just don't know uh when stuff gets over here about scientology sometimes i i remember when i first heard they were gonna do an ideal org there i thought they must be wrong but they mm-hmm. are do you know anything about the the venue or the site or anything like that about where they're if we're thinking about the same thing, I know that they brought some property um, in Saint Denis, which is not a, it's not like upscale um, a suburb. It's, a, wow. it's, a, but it is, I think, um, placed strategically between the airport and and the town, um, and and it, it's not a bad place to 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 make a shrewd investment. But what they're doing to, it, I know that the local mayor, I think, tried to block their development and unsuccessfully right um, but i haven't really been keeping up to date with it but i suspect they use it as a base to send people out to paris and to do their own uh public relations exercises uh, i'm sure um, but the press are very aware of how they operate now and they're very skeptical and they're not afraid to point out what's happening and there are plenty of former members i think who are out there um i don't think roger gone is very active anymore i have lost touch with him but i think there are other people who are still fairly vocal fairly active um and and they will be quick to alert so the the newspapers if something's happening it's it's become a kind of an easy subject i think for for some for some um broadcasters and newspapers to to have a go at scientology not always for the best reasons but there has been some good stuff 
done on them. In fact, I was talking to the documentary crew um, just a few weeks ago, and they'll be putting something out, I think, later this year. Uh, that was tough trying to do it in French. It's hard to to formulate your ideas in 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 French. You get halfway through the sentence and think, "Hang on, can we do that again?" So, I left him with a nightmare editing job. So I apologize for that. You know, hopefully that works. Well, I'm glad they're consulting with you, though. They should be. That's great. That's great to hear. Yeah, it was strange because uh, I've been away from it for a while, and I thought, "Oh, am I going to get this right?" But he said, "No, don't worry. We're not asking you for the dates and every dot and squiggle. We just want to make general points and." And, you know, you tell us what you want to. And if you're not comfortable, question you say, which is fine. Um, and so I was able to try and articulate what I thought were the most important points. Uh, but it was a useful exercise. It's, it's hard enough to do it in English. French, it was a, it was even more tricky, but um, it was good to do. And and uh, it gave me the opportunity to look back at some of the work I've been doing. I'm thinking, actually, you know, that that wasn't so bad after all. Oh, no. I've really been completely knackered at the end, but it was worth it. You know, so good, so so thoroughly researched, and everything you did was so solid. Uh, I was always so impressed by uh, how, you know, I I write like a columnist. Sometimes I act like an ass, but you yeah. always were so balanced and objective. Of course, Scientology doesn't doesn't uh, appreciate that, right? I mean, did you get much? blowback from them over the years i got very little blowback and um, partly because i think there's not much you can do when you're complaining about when, when you're looking at court coverage so a lot of my stuff was court coverage the initial stuff i did on the violence at the top i don't think they cared about me frankly i wasn't on their radar ra radar because there were more important people like this in petersburg time team doing stuff and i think you were always more of a target as well because you were putting stuff out on a daily basis i could never manage that so i I sort of profited from the fact that I kind of flew under their radar. I wasn't that important. And then when that finally was on their radar, well, it was mainly court coverage, which meant that I was giving their side of the story as well. So they couldn't really uh they couldn't really complain. And I will I will protect the innocent here, but I did actually have one or two Scientologists during the Brussels trial come to me and say, actually, your coverage is quite good. I thought, oh, thanks. And I, I should have said, can I have that in writing? But no, 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 I don't think I would have got that. <laughs> but I, I have to say, I was I was flattered because perhaps them saying that was quite surprising. There was a point when early in the trial, I identified some of the defendants and I noticed that the Belgian papers weren't doing that. They had this thing with a first name and initial, which is something that happens in, in some countries. I don't think in France, but it does happen in Belgium and Germany. Even, even there, it's fairly clear. You have to be very careful about identifying people. And they came to me and they said, uh, uh, and they said, look, please, because I legally I was able to name them. I said, please, could you not name this? This is devastating. And, and her, her family is really upset. And. And, uh, and I said, look, I've looked at the coverage in Belgium. I understand what you're saying, and I'm not having to go at you. So I immediately changed it, and I made a wee note at the bottom saying I've changed it. Because I thought, there's no skin off my nose. I'm not out there to humiliate and hurt people. And they were going through a very tough time anyway. And I think that was appreciated. Um, so it's nice to, to give the to confront them with the fact that we're not all monsters you know well of course you are of course but but all civilized chaps and what you know it was it was a, what i try and do because i've noticed a lot i mean you do your stuff in, in a really good hard-nosed no-nonsense manner and i think you've taken enough flack from them to have earned the right to sort of throw a few barbs back but um i've noticed that in some of the chat rooms especially some of the people who aren't necessarily former members there's a lot of unnecessary abuse it doesn't help it generates more heat than light um, and and specifically as a journalist as well, you, you can't afford to be doing too much of that, and and that's not something you've ever engaged in. You've got you've you've permitted yourself a certain sense of humour, which I think is what you need when you're covering Scientology on a daily basis. But at the same time, um, you do your due diligence, you check with them. They're obviously not going to come back and comment, but they know that um, they know how we operate, and they know you get your facts right. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't still be in business, you know. Right. But there are different rules in different countries. I have run into this issue where in the United States, if somebody is accused of a crime and it's in, it's down in a you know charge sheet, you can name them. I mean, it's just the yeah. way we do it here, and you don't do it in England, they don't do it in Australia. And I am, but I am, you know, conscious of the fact that sometimes the Scientologist who's accused of something was, you know under a lot of pressure uh, in a totalitarian organization to do these things. In fact, there was a, a kind of a, uh, I tried to do this with an interesting recent story in Florida. There's a Scientologist woman 
who's accused of hit and run uh, of a cyclist that left him dead. And so everyone's like, oh, she, it's because she's a Scientologist. She's a horrible person. Um, and I was just curious because I'm a cyclist and I'm always concerned about things like that. And I, I got the actual documents on what happened. And sadly, it was mostly the cyclist's fault. And this woman just, you know, made a legal turn and he made an illegal turn into her. And her crime was not sticking around. And I said, look, she panicked. That's not good. She's going to pay a price. But can we lower the rhetoric about this evil Scientologist accused of a crime? So, you know, you, you find those situations where you need to look a little deeper into the case to see who's really at fault for things. Anyway, I just, it's, that came to my mind when you mentioned that, when you talked about defendants uh, not wanting their names out there. That's yeah. one of those it's things. It's a tough we... decision. But, I mean, that's a great example that you cite there of you can't do the rush to judgment. You can't say, oh, Santor is guilty. No, and hang on a minute. It's not It's not that simple. And especially as journalists, we we have certain, you know, ethical goes and to do and you know you could argue i was a bit too soft on that but i noticed that what what the common practice was in belgium and i followed that in france i was naming them because that was being done in france and so for me that that was a no-brainer but i think the important thing is it's i think there was perhaps some of the writing that i've read in some of the people that are more sympathetic to to um the likes of scientology um they they've noted what they say is a kind of a cult-like reaction in the anti-cult movement. And I thought, oh, for God's sake. But then I thought, well, no, hang on a minute. Because you look at some of the chat rooms and there is a lot of venom and they they do um, they do a lot of trolling, shall we say. And some of that, you know, okay, fair enough. They had it coming, especially um, when they were trying to shut down the internet and that they, they got themselves a bloody nose trying to do that. That, that was the great story of the 90s, how, how Scientology met its match. Um, and that was fine. But there were, there were times when it, it went too far and it got too nasty and individual people were being targeted and, and and that's not actually helpful that's only going to entrench positions because you know that the the senior scientologists that you're attacking today could well be the whistleblower of tomorrow and so right. that's perhaps that's another reason that i'm doing that i had fairly good relations with one of the top spokesmen for scientology in france and i i think i i had his respect you know we would meet for lunch once or twice and have a off the record conversation uh and um you know, he never threatened me. He never showed any, any, he wasn't trying to pull a fast one. He was just trying to sound me out to get an idea of who I was. And I was trying to do the same for him. And I always thought it never happened, but I always thought, I tell you, if this guy ever decides to leave, he's got some stories to tell. It didn't happen. So my charm offensive failed, but maybe that's another reason that um, I try not to, to, to go full in on them because I'm thinking there may be a day when they want to be out. And maybe, you know, if I'm, if I'm in their face all the time or if, if I'm dancing in glee at every defeat they have, I may be the last person they want to talk to. But uh, there may be times, you know, when people are prepared to um, to actually come speak to you because of that. And remember, th there was a time when Mike Rinder was vilified by a lot of people. Um, and I, you know, I, I wasn't a big fan of him because I knew what he'd done when he first came out. There was a lot of skepticism at the time is about, oh, Mike and Marty, they say they're, you know, and their different parts has been very telling. But the fact is, you know, would they have had the would Mike uh, have had the courage to go as far as he had if he hadn't had the support? I think probably mainly of former members, um, but also if he'd been faced with you know um, uniform hostility, would he have had the courage to go as far as he did in, in denouncing the movement? I mean, all, all credit to him uh, and to Leo Ramini, Ramini for the work they've done. Um, but if everyone had been hostile from the beginning it would be much harder for them to make those first steps especially for somebody like Mike Rinder who I think has done a fairly comprehensive job of of um, coming clean on what he's done in the past uh, well and you you it's interesting that you mentioned that about former members because I think Mike definitely uh benefited if you read his book he talks about the former members that he reached out to when he was just barely trying to survive getting out and he was selling cars in Denver and stuff. You know, he he was very fortunate that there were some ex-members. But another thing that was interesting about him was that, um, you know, as you say, you have done your best to generate a respectful relationship with the Scientology spokesperson so that they will talk to you. He did the same thing so that when he came out, he had good relationships with several journalists 
mm-hmm. who then they were able to, you know, hey, let's let's do this. Let's talk. So I think, you know, the fact that he had a really good relationship with John Sweeney and with the Tampa Bay Times guys really helped him uh, get through, you know, be, go from an escapee to someone speaking out. So that was you're right. I think those journalists were really smart to develop relationships with him, civil relationships, so that when he changed teams, uh, they were ready to, to, to get his story. So, and of That's course, we're, we're rooting I for did. him now. We're rooting for him now. You know, he's going through yeah. a tough, tough thing and uh, we're all thinking about him. So, um, well, listen, man, this has been great. I, I want people to see that, you know, sometimes they just, they see a story in a newspaper, they see a story on, and they just think of journalists. They don't know what to think about the people that create them. I want them to see how journalists really think about these issues. They care about the people they're talking to. They're trying to find the most fair way to tell a story that's as close to the truth. And, you know, I I think that you're somebody that wrestles with that stuff as, you know, as well as anybody, and you're able to articulate it. I really appreciate that. Thank you. It's been great fun working with you. Well, I hope we'll, hopefully we'll do a wee bit more down the road. Uh, I'll see if I can't. Uh, well, you know, yeah. when stuff comes out over there, and I'm confused. You're the first person I email right away. So hopefully we'll have some more things coming up. I hope so, too. All right, Johnny. Thank you very much, man. Take care, Tony. Bye-bye. Oh, wait, 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 wait. It's okay. I can. Whoa, 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 whoa. I was hitting the wrong thing. <laughs>